So I guess I've been talking about of a lot of um, commercial and stuff, but what did you do at CRAM on the project if you are a so-called um, civil engineer? So it's a highway project. Um, I guess my experiences before that I um, shared was nothing to do with highways. <laughs> So um, it, I, I always worked with highway. I always worked along with highway, worked alongside with um, highway engineers. But I, um, and in the UK, I don't think we get modules that we study highways. Um, I guess some universities do, but um, I think what I was quite surprised with Africa and some Malaysia, um, some people that studied in Malaysia and stuff, and the US, they actually have uh, modules on highways. I guess what well, highways is something that you learn. So um, I worked up to, so I worked on the subgrade um, and then the sub base and then um, also the base. I, I, I left before they got to this, um, before the termac um, came. Um, I'd done quite a lot of um, FDD tests. So literally um, just getting the sand cone and then testing the holes and then measuring the um, literally on site as well. So that was quite a lot of, um, um, just like um, basically measuring the volume of the hole and then the mass of the sand um, over the um, density and then you had to calculate what the wet the, the wet density so the mass of the um, excavated soil over the volume of the hole um, so that was quite interesting actually um, quite a lot of um, a Somali engineer actually taught me um, a lot of this information so I kind of trained underneath him um to actually get this so um much appreciated to the somali engineers um that gave me that information um and that actually let me go into the lab um i've always heard about material engineers but i've actually never worked close with materials engineers so i was quite interested um to get a bit of knowledge and experience in material material engineering um they were quite surprised that i was a master at from the UK and I didn't know about uh, material engineering um, and I said to them the last module I took on material engineering was at my bachelor's um, so yeah um, just thought to so yeah that was quite interesting next slide so this is the amount so this is I tried to give a, a widespread of the project and how the project is so literally as you can see this is the middle of nowhere towards um towards the um towards if you can see towards the back that's the road if you can see um i can't really control my curse yeah so that's literally the road so that's kilometer zero so this kilometer one actually and kilometer zero is towards um um towards the other side basically if you go towards the left hand of the picture and then kilometer 25 and our sahab lord is towards the right so this is a site complex um the amount of vehicles as you can see um all the people are kind of involved on the project um crane so one of the things that i was quite um let's just say about crane lifting for example loading um let's just say the permit for a crane wasn't there and that's something that can improve um but i was quite surprised from the chinese side and the um ugandan side and somali side that wasn't consistent because the amount of permits that you have to do in the uk just to even do a crane lifting it's quite um surprising um so yeah we've got a crane there um not sure about what ton that crane is um and then you, you can see the different segregation of soils here so we would have a bit of um lab test just i guess putting soles over here then this is where our offices are towards behind the um the cranes that's where yeah that would be the offices and then towards the left of that similar building structure which you can't see in the picture is where the chinese um workers will actually live um and then the right hand side is where the design consultants will be as well you can see how collaborative it is not really in any cfu contract but the designers one side and the contracts um the contractors one side um literally as we go back if you could just put the cursor towards where the road is um that's the only part that the project own um towards the right hand side of the road um that's someone else that's someone owns that land and towards the left hand side of the road someone else owns that land as well um so that was quite interesting as well when we we're working um in that so we'd have our own circuits in that area 
towards the bottom hand right of that's where our kitchen is where we get our food so we had our own chef, Somali chef you know um so she would make our food and stuff like that so having rice and meat on a project that I've never that was a quite an interesting thing um next slide so um I guess so this, this is a project that I actually went with this is this is not Hergesa bypass this is to do with Togwa Wachale so this I went a project I so one of my mates I guess a female engineer actually she actually she's got her own contract um construction company in Somaliland and her and another company in the UK actually wanted to go ahead and bid for this project um this is in Togwa Wachale um and this project still hasn't happened but Hergesa Bypass, Berbera Corridor, will link to Togwa Chale, then Togwa Chale will link to Adsababa. So this is Wachale, if everyone knows, this is the city just before you get to Ethiopia. So as you can see on that current billboard, this is the control poles. So we're on the Ethiopian side, and then just towards the left on that current um, billboard, that is um, the Somaliland side. So in this current area, if this area is going to be used for um, economic growth and then also um, transporting goods from one side to the other, um, you have to think about people transport. Um, so moving people from one side to the other. And then you also have to think about goods as well. So what type of vehicles are going to be moving back and forth? So I went with my mate of mine um, who just literally just to spec spectate the amount of contractors that get involved in a bid um so this was just a bid um this was literally just a um presentation which the mayor of um somaliland wachale and the mayor of ethiopia wachale was presenting to contractors to bid um to come up with an actual cost estimate on how much that this road might cost um so yeah that was my first initial i think meeting that i've ever had on a bid so i just thought to share it with you guys because this is how a project is in the beginning um before it's actually implemented next slide So this is a project and now you can all research about Hergesa Bypass, it's um, all completed, it's ready to go, I guess people are driving on it, some people are sending videos for me on Snapchat or Insta, they're like we're on the road that you worked on, so I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of that legacy. In the UK to also be a part of that legacy, neighboring Ethiopia, economic growth, and all, um, overall pop um, poverty and um, reduction in that area. So I guess there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of um, statistics that's going to come up because the amount of SME companies that project helped, the amount of people that it trained. Um, I guess infrastructure and engineering projects are not only um, building and concrete. It's also um, knowing the legacy that you leave behind and the people that you train. So the amount of people that was trained on that project, they can also support other people coming up. So yeah, just thought to share that. And then um, we'll just open up to Q and A's, I guess. I think I spoke a lot. I hope I didn't speak too fast guys, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Karan. Uh, how do you want to do the questions? Do you want to just, do you want to, do you want people to type it in the chat or do you want people just to raise their hand and then unmute and then just ask a question? Um, yeah, I think we can see the ones that of so I can read, can read through the ones and then um, on the chat and then I guess speak to people. And then sure. we can maybe stop the call. I don't, but you know, but um, in Hergesa corridor, an alternative route road to road one, which currently connects Hergesa to Berbera, or is it a project consisting of repairing refurb? So it's a new road, um, Hergesa, um, Hergesa bypass. Um, I'm not aware of Hergesa corridor, but Hergesa bypass goes on top of Hergesa. So Dushi Sumara, rather than going through Hergesa. Um, and then road one goes through Hergesa. So this will stop the traffic because there's a lot of vehicles that go for Hergesa at the moment. So rather than the big vehicles going within Hergesa, within, within Hergesa it will go on top of it. 
Um, I hope I understood. Um, and then refers, ref, um, resurfacing and repairing. I think the mayor of Hergesa is doing a lot of work. Um, I actually haven't been in Hergesa for like the last seven months, but I've heard there's a lot of work that he's doing currently at the moment. So props to him. How was the quality monitored on site? And um, was the project cost for the works? What codes of practice were the roads being designed to? So how was quality monitored on site? So there was quality, um, there was, I wouldn't say it was ITPs, um, inspection test plans. However, there were quite, of um, the consultant would actually reject some of the quality things that the contractor actually um, poses to them. So there was, there was a, let's just say an amended ITP to make sure that the, the, uh, the moisture and the density of the soil was correct. So we would go onto site and make sure that gets managed. Um, and then, so for example, if on the on certain roads, um, surfaces of the road of the soil, we would literally, the consultant would just go take a part of that soil, test it, and then make sure that the results that we're providing is correct and it's to the correct standard. Um, what was the project, what was the cost for the work? So originally, I think the project was um, around the sum of like 14 million. I don't know what was the end of the cost of the project. Um, but I know there was a bit of back and forth with that on the pricing. So um, I, it was in the range of um, 14 million. Um, what codes of practices were the roads being designed to? So it was a UK, UK funded project, which I know that they're working towards the UK. The, there were some, I guess, discrepancies in the Euro, European standards and the British standards when it comes to density. So some of that were replaced with some American standards. Um, but the overall arching was the British standards on the project. Um, but I guess the, the Chinese interpreting um, the British standards, they were quite surprised, some of our standards as well. So there was a lot of back and forth and technicality on that. Generally, how well is um, the framework practiced in the design and construction industry in Somaliland? Are contractors required to comply to typical industry standards, guidelines, and building codes? So this project was a... Um, international project. Um, so they did actually had to follow standards. But one of the things that gaps where I did invite an individual today to he couldn't make it but um, they are working towards building codes at the moment, moment, they are working towards building regulations. Um, Somalia or Somaliland was a war torn country. So I think they are coming to a, a stance where um, I guess safety, security and money was such an option, but now I guess engineers um, are coming together and saying these qualities need to be put in place. Um, so there is a lot of gap um, and opportunity to improve the standards within um, um, Somaliland um, bodies, I guess. Is there any other questions? Are there any other questions, guys? If you want to ask a question, raise your hand and I'll meet you. So um, the Chinese involvement in the project, so they, so I guess they, it was a Somali project, guys. So there's a Somali contractor um, who actually owns this project currently. Um, he actually bidded this project. So in Somaliland, you cannot actually own a project if you're not a citizen. So you have to, like, basically, um, in terms of contracts. So an individual, a foreigner can't just go and say, I want to go and build in Somaliland. The, the law won't allow you to. So it was with a joint adventure with a Somali contractor as well. So the Somali contractor and the Chinese contractor worked alongside together. I'm um, sorry, I forgot to miss that out. So in terms of the project, you'd have the project manager who was Chinese and then the Somali, uh, the deputy project manager who was Somali. Um, and then the finance department, for example, that I was working with, the stakeholder, stakeholder team, um, the procurement team, were all um, Somalis and then the technicality of the team, majority in the main contractor were Chinese. What was the Chinese involvement on the project and were they responsible for the training and how do you become involved? How did I become involved in the, um, this amazing project? So I actually applied for the Chinese contractor. I did take a big salary cut working in Africa. So guys don't think if you go to Africa that you're gonna get a lot of money in projects. Um, but I just think it was it was an opportunity for COVID. Um, I wanted to build my skills. Obviously, being in Ansoalido wasn't key, Adi. 
um, it was quite challenging. Um, I did learn a lot of emotional intelligence, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think in general, I learned a lot how to deal with work with Chinese contractors and also work with the lovely so-called Somali men as well. So that was quite challenging, cough, cough. Um, yeah, so that was good. Are there any further questions? Yeah, yes, I got oh. one. Uh, uh, thank you, Sikram, for the very, very nice presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, actually, I'm from there and I've been here near to the UK. So um, I was just asking, is uh, were there any bridges along the road or you were just building the road? Um, yes, so I did, I did work, I did see, um, so it, I was a part of the design implement, this um, geotechnics, um, I guess the, the trial hole testing when it came up to um, the bridges, but I was, I wasn't there when the bridge was getting installed. Um, but I guess there's one bridge on Hergesa bypass um, and the majority of the bridge are on the other, but a better corridor. Um, so that the Arabs are building, so that section, um, yeah, so I did, there's only one bridge that were built in Hergesa Bypass along, I think, the ninth kilometre. Did I answer your question? So, um, on, so I guess someone asked a question about Somali Development Fund. So Somali Development Fund, um, so are there more opportunities coming through this SDF pipeline in the near future? So um, an individual of ours, um, an individual that I know, his name is Mustafa, that also wants to attend this, but he was like, can we get the meetings on a Friday? Um, he's also, with, he can do a presentation. So he is actually a structural engineer who works for Mott McDonald's on the Somaliland, Somaliland Development Fund. Um, and the Somaliland Development Fund is an organization which is made up, I think, of the UK, Norway, and Denmark, I think. Um, and is a pool of money which they do projects within um, Somaliland. Um, so, within that I think he sent me a message on what he would like to touch base and what he would like to talk about and what projects he's involved so um, he's your maid I think there's also if people are aware of if their geotechnics is aware so he would like to give a also a presentation um, which is more technical on two major projects an 82 kilometer road uh, rehabilitation re on construction of fishing jetty um, plus two minor rural roads construction, which support livestock and holding ground projects. So the current consultancy company that actually work with SDF is Mott McDonald's. So everyone's quite surprised when I've told them that Mott McDonald's in Somaliland, but they are. So um, yeah, I guess we'll see upcoming. But I think majority of, if you kind of search on SDF's page, you can see the amount of projects that they're there at the moment. But if there's any future projects within SDF, I think we can ask him to elaborate on that, but I am not sure. How did you get the opportunity to work in Somalia and did you apply somewhere or is it more about who you know? And thank you for your presentation. Um, so I actually applied towards um, to the Chinese um, contractor COCCC. I had an interview with them. Um, I, um, in terms of supporting, in terms of getting in Somaliland or working in Somalia, I would advise you to always live with a family um, and to know people that are there rather than just going. Um, if you do get an opportunity to work with a charity or to work with um, um, different projects, it's always good to have someone to take you around I guess but I did have support from family but getting the opportunity um I did go and apply directly to the Chinese contractor um they were when I did apply for them I guess salary um opportunities and stuff but um were, were quite a bit of a but I'd wanted that opportunity during COVID so I took that opportunity to work on site um as I said before my experience was more in design and I wanted to take the opportunity to work um, on a site in Africa to develop my skills and come back to the UK. And I think the 
amount of knowledge I gathered, um, I was quite surprised that my brain could actually con contain all of that knowledge, I guess. Um, like during halfway, I'm like, I need to go back home. I can't handle this, guys. Like simple things like mosquito bites or um, I getting told in Umbata, I don't get involved in the conversations. But I guess all of the things, rather than just complaining as human beings as we are, I just took all of that to make myself even more stronger and stronger. And then getting more knowledge and then researching and then as I said highways wasn't really my speciality but then I had to learn about highways and material engineering and then um, learning more about quality standards and then you know excelling my knowledge to actually support me in work. So in terms of my current role that I was I, so I was I I went as a design engineer um, but I ended up I think being more of a community engagement <laughs> role um, but I guess the first few months I literally was working on site and, and was doing a lot of FCT um, was working as a material engineer or alongside the material engineer and was doing a bit of draftman um, drawings as well so it was more highways design um, walala. but my background is um, utility engineering um, are there any more questions? I think I'm an I'm an architect engineering student about to graduate at UCL. Inshallah, want to get involved in infrastructure later on. What would you recommend for me? Um, about to graduate. I think um, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer that question, but I always say to. Um, to graduates make sure you get experience um, and then also make sure your dissertation is something that's current and um, that you can speak about in an interview. What type of sacrifices and things did you experience that you didn't expect and would you say you've learned from the experience compared to a typical project in the UK? So that's a really good question actually. Um, I've actually done a personality test, um, which I think everyone should do a personality test and it shows your weaknesses and your strengths. Um, I guess in the UK, I was really sh shielded in my whole career and my whole education. Um, I think a lot of people that have, are adaptable um, that, you know, some people that some people might call them freshies or some people that their English is not their first language, you know, they've come from Europe. Um, I guess all of them people have a lot of skills or can adapt really quickly. But with me, I've always been in London, born and raised in London, worked in London. Um, I've only just, I think, moved from working class and then to a middle class industry like engineering. I've never had a big shift and anything calamity, alhamdulillah, in my life to to experience anything or to challenges. But when I went to Africa, it was a big challenge in all different um, aspects. I guess um, one of the biggest challenges, um, I think women in general, when it comes to Domar Kaswalida, were quite independent. I guess all the women in the Sok, in Hergesa, were Domar, they all like basically are all business women. So um, I don't, in general, I don't think the Somali culture would ever, you know, we don't need to, in an Somali, that's not really in our culture. Um, so Somali women are quite entrepreneurial, they're quite, you know, go getters. Um, working on the site, actually, there was an environmental engineer who worked for the consultant. There was a communicate, there was a, um, a, a social um, sociology, I guess, what I would call it a stakeholder engagement, but someone that, um, I think they called it something social, and I don't know what it was, but yeah, she was just a, a person that was lead of communication. And then we had a finance lead also, she was a Somali all, all had a geisa born and all went to university and had geisa. Um, and then obviously you had the cooks and the cleans and they were all females as well. But there was quite a lot of intellectual women that I've worked with on that project. Um, I think more women, I worked with more women on that had geisa bypass project than I've ever worked with women, women in the UK. So that was quite surprising. So I had more women in a meeting um, than I would have 
basically having a project in the UK. So that was quite amazing on the head of case of bypass. But the biggest sacrifice was working in the heat um, changing the food, I guess. Um, and then also understanding the Dagan and the Deen in um in the country like obviously i'm a somali but I'm, I'm you know i'm somali i'm muslim but then also understanding the difference so somali women in somalia sure that they won't eat in front of men <laughs> no they'll hide in a corner and eat their food a lot of people think it's you know demoralizing women but it's basically that's dakan and you have to understand dakan so if anyone goes internationally and you want to work abroad you need to understand and learn the culture where you're working in and do not make it a um, barrier but understand the culture if you understand the culture and you use it to more of your advantage it won't become a disadvantage so i guess just learning the culture in that area is um, is a big thing um, and then embracing it. So most diasporas go back to Africa and say, hi, everyone, I'm your saviour. I'm here to save you. You're no one's saviour. Nebi Mutahid, you're not a prophet. Just work alongside the people and treat people the way they're meant to be treated, if they're African or not. I think, I think we've reached our time. Just, thank you very yeah. much. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a fantastic lecture. Uh, hopefully, hopefully um the first of many hopefully <laughs> um but yeah i think we'll end it there inshallah and thank you for everyone else that attended um so thank you